Dear Oxygen, you are the sweet elixir of life. You swim in the veins of every living creature, a messiah rushing through billions of scarlet tributaries. One tiny molecule capable of corroding iron, incinerating coal, and powering civilizations. The thing is, though, I didn't even notice you until you were gone. I'm sorry, it must have been jarring when you rushed into my lungs and was met with an impenetrable barrier of goo. I promise I did everything I could to help you stay. I used the inhaler every day with a plastic canister to get the dosage right. I avoided pollen like it was the plague. Unfortunately, asthma is a stubborn son of a bitch. I was prepared when I had that asthma attack, or at least I thought I was. Crisp blue brochures from the doctor's office had spelt out the syllables in words that I tried and failed to understand. Corticosteroids. Inflammation. Poring over the crude diagrams of trusted adults and step-by-step -step healthcare plans did nothing to prepare me for the symptoms in their execution. Severe wheezing. Coughing that won't stop chest tightness or pressure, an overwhelming inability to breathe, an all-consuming terror of the existence of mortality, a desperate desire to get to the next breath, the next breath, the next breath. The diaphragm comes down, the ribcage comes up, the bronchi swell, the mucus rises, you were trapped, lodged, dead in my throat. The next breath, the next breath, the next breath. Every shuddering gasp was futile. The only oxygen left were the vestiges of the previous breath left in my lungs, maybe 30% of a breath. According to Carrot, that's about three to six words, depending on volume, length, and overall breathiness. Let's round that to four. So, four words per breath. What was I supposed to do with four words? Suddenly, the words, let's keep in touch, were inadequate to capture the tear streak goodbyes, the inside jokes, the taste of friendship distilled into a glass of apple juice on the summer holidays. Inhale, exhale, I'll see you tonight would pale in comparison to the years, the honeyed hymns sung in the holding of hands, painted in scars and calluses and wrinkles over the decades, the freshly cut daisy flowers offered shyly on a distant spring evening now arranged by the bedside every day. Inhale, exhale. The witness signs here would be decaying leaves in the face of a lifetime. They would crunch under the weight of a high school graduation, a university degree, a love, a family, a million unsung moments, a million moments captured in dusty photo albums, a white picket fence, paradise in suburbia, blood, sweat, tears, a gray hair, a black veil, Stories and picket fences and moments and tears pass from fading palms to the ones that go on. And not a good crunch either. The kind of crunch that happens when you see the dead leaves all excited and you stride up to it and lift up the sole of your shoe and then when the sole comes down the leaf is still kind of springy and it makes like a sad little shh noise like a dead slug. Inhale, gasp, choke, exhale. At that moment, Four words fluttering pathetically in clammy palms. There was a world of difference between I love you and I really love you. Especially when those words could have been hospital or call triple zero or where is that blasted inhaler? I guess what I'm trying to ask, Oxygen, is why you're so damn easy to waste. Life is so fast nowadays. The next payday, the next job, the next weekend, repeat. The diaphragm comes down, the ribcage comes up, and the air comes in. Inhale. The diaphragm comes up, the ribcage comes down, and the air comes out. Exhale. The next payday, the next job, the next weekend, repeat. The next breath, the next breath, the next breath. It's funny how when chasing the next goal, the next breath, we forget to actually breathe. It's a weird paradox, isn't it? We chase you all the time in workplace promotions and A grades, and yet we don't appreciate the satisfying clack of a laptop keyboard 
or the giggly manic high that seems to possess caffeinated people at 3am. We, we get on a roller coaster to hear the dying rumble as the carriage slows to a stop at the end, forgetting to throw our arms up and enjoy the ride. All these years, I've been treating you like a single-use plastic bottle, discarded and replaced, discarded and replaced. I've wasted words. I've inhaled, exhaled, got the promotion, inhaled, exhaled. I've wasted you. Funnily enough, you're one of the few things that does grow on trees, in a way, but that doesn't mean that you're immune to apathy on the receiving end. I've forgotten the feeling of what it's like to just be, to let you fill my lungs and to smile with the sensation of fullness, soft and curled up inside my chest. What would happen if I stopped trying to get to places for the sake of it and just breathed? If 30% of a breath is four words, then doing the math, 100% of a breath is about 13. What can I do with 13 words? I think I'd say I'm grateful. I still laugh at our inside jokes, still taste apple juice. Inhale. I'd say life is short. Success is meaningless in the whole grand scheme of things. Exhale. Inhale. I'd say I've learned that love isn't finite. I love you. I really love you. Exhale. I'm sorry it took an asthma attack to realize that. A desperate desire to get to the next breath, the next breath, the next breath. Hyperventilating, hyperfixating on what may never come. Maybe the most important thing is to use the oxygen that we do have. To appreciate the value of the small things. Whether that's a final hug with a friend, a good cup of coffee, a book you couldn't put down. Or words. Four, five, one thousand and two hundred. However many we've got left before the diaphragm comes up, the ribcage comes down, and the air comes out. Sincerely, an asthmatic. Sunday Noodles. Every Sunday morning, the first thing Papa does is turn on the radio to listen to the only Chinese station there was on the island. She replaces the incense in our altar and gets started on the noodles. By the time I wake up, the anchovy broth is already violently bubbling. The handful of noodles are prepared and set on the counter. The salty smell of soy sauce takes over the house. The wok spits off some fried garlic and Teresa Tang sweetly sings in the midst of it all. Ni wen wa ai ni yo do shen, wa ai ni yo ji fen. You ask how deep I care for you, how much I love you so. Sundays are the peak of my week. Growing up on a multicultural, English-dominated island with immigrant parents made it easy for my family to adapt, however difficult for a Chinese-speaking child like me to socialize. From freely, fluently speaking and singing my mother tongue, to being placed in an environment where English was the main language spoken, I learned early on that it took a while for my friends to understand me, and a while for me to understand them. My childhood was never lonely, and I never felt excluded. It was just a matter of how hard I tried to communicate. The language barrier I faced when I, first, when I was first placed in kindergarten didn't make my peers treat me in a way that made me feel less included. It was a lack of effort I put in to break the barrier that made me a very unsociable five-year-old. My parents knew of this, however, were much more concerned in investing their time trying to grow their starting business. Moving 1,680 kilometers away from their homeland, to an isolated island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, my family couldn't waste any time on me, nor money. However, as busy as they were, every Sunday they would leave work early to help make Sunday noodles. I remember the way my sister would purposely drop a humongous bowl of dough into the boiling water and quickly run off laughing to our room in fear of Papa scolding her. I remember the way that I did the same and ran off half screaming and laughing to the playground on the hill above my house because my sister always locked the door to our room, leaving me to fend for myself. Living on the end of the street next to the forest, the playground was my hideaway. It was always surrounded by thick trees and leaves, making it hard for other people to find. It was the first place I visited when the air in the house got too suffocating. 
the feeling of grass between my toes, the warmth of the sun against my face, the earthy smell of dirt, the sound of leaves rustling against the wind, and the sight of the ocean from the roof of my playground always made me forget my childish concern. This Your smile is so familiar to me, but I just can't recall the moment. Even today, those feelings of loneliness and concern are always replaced by a warm bowl of noodles and a pair of chopsticks placed in the, my spot on the dinner table by the time I run back down to my house. It is moments like these that a photograph could never capture, because pictures can't make me taste the rich broth of ban mian. The Art of Giving I first read The Giving Tree when I was eight years old. I don't remember why I took the caterpillar green book from the shelf, but I remember sitting on my bedroom floor and feeling a feeling I rarely felt. It felt as if my breath could not reach my lungs, as if something was being forced out of me or a great wave was rearing inside. And then I felt the tears in my eyes. I remember slamming the book shut and shoving it to the very back of my bookcase where I would never find it again. Crying was reserved for a skin knee or losing a chess game to my little sister. Not books, never books. The Giving Tree is about a tree and a boy. When the boy is young, they play together and the tree is happy. As the boy grows older, the tree sees him less and less. And when she does see him, he wants things from her. First, he asks for her apples, then her leaves, her branches, and these she gives. Happily. The story ends with an old man sitting on a stump, but the tree is happy. She will never again feel the wind in her branches or sun on her leaves, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that she's been reduced to a stump in the ground, a bump on the horizon. The boy is with her, so she is happy. We turn onto the driveway. Who's running down? Dad looks back expectantly. My younger sister Bean is out of the car in a flash and careening down the steep driveway. I hesitate for a moment, held back by a feeling of maturity. But Middle Cove is ageless. As the rest of the world grows and changes, my Nana's house remains the same. It means family and board games, long afternoons making paper aeroplanes and watching movies by the fireside. Something has kept and continues to keep it out of the reach of time's corrosive fingers. I used to think it was a spell cast by the Sydney bush, full of twisting trees and bright bird song. But I've begun to realize that the house is protected by its owner, who extinguishes the shadows and inspires joy. I've never met anyone like my Nana. And the older I get, the more I realize I probably never will. I do kind things, like walk the dog during my sister's week, or make mum lunch without being asked. But Nana is kind. Her kindness is a habit. She doesn't think about what she's doing, or pause to wonder how much time it is taking. She just does it. Like the time I dropped my phone and practically had to dive on it to stop her from bending to get it. Or when we came home late, and she let her dinner get cold so she could feed the dog. And how, at the end of every visit, she leaves something for us. A few lollies, or some nice pens, for us to find after we've said goodbye. Constant acts of kindness that make the grass greener and sunshine brighter. The thought of seeing Nana is what gets me out of the car and flings me down the driveway, pushing the wind through my hair faster and faster. My sister and I sitting on the floor, surrounded by books and boxes. We are sorting Nana's bookcase. The books are dusty, the pages a little brittle, and the color of honey. There are collections of cartoons that are older than I, and books that trigger memories, hazy with age. As we flip through the hard covers and glossy illustrations, Bean begins to talk. She is vexed and her frustrated fidgeting sends dust spiraling into the air. I don't get why she lets Nadia use her like that. 
She's scared of driving and yet every week she drives more than an hour to go babysit for her 50 year old daughter. Why does she do it? I shrug. We've been having this conversation on and off since we arrived. She's kind. She wants to help. Bean nods, but she still doesn't get it. Neither do I. Not really. A thoughtful silence settles, as does the dust. I come across a book with a caterpillar green cover. On the front are a boy and a tree. Don't you think she's putting herself in danger? Says Bean. Car accidents are common, especially at her age. Why does she do it? This question is different from the first time she asked it. Gentler. I look up to meet her eyes, but I don't see anger. I see fear. I look back down at the book, unable to hold her forlorn gaze, and realize why the book looks so familiar, because she wants to. Helping makes her happy. I point to the book submerged in the velvety tears of nostalgia. Nana is like the giving tree. Bean and I lie on the floor, and the book is sadder than it ever was with this new layer of meaning. It's not the tree having its apples picked and branches chopped, but Nana. My first instinct is that we have to do something. We have to stop letting her be so nice. We have to stop letting her buy us things and get up early to make us breakfast. But then I realise, we aren't taking. She is giving. Willingly. Happily. Nana seems destined to be reduced to a stump by the people who love her most, but she wouldn't have it any other way. You can't blame the boy for taking what the tree wanted to give him, but you can blame him for not being grateful. So, Nana, I may never quite understand your relentless desire to give, but I will always say thank you and mean it. A couple of days ago, someone asked if I had any pets, and I replied with the same thing I always do. About six years ago on Mother's Day, I had an encounter with a saltwater crocodile. My dad runs an Aboriginal tour company out on our property. The property is called Udiella, and the company is called Up To You. At the time, we had a family come out for a couple of days to do a tour with us. When they arrived, we had morning tea and then got ready to go to the river. Mum and Dad stayed back and started to cook lunch. My sister, my Uncle Neil, our two dogs, Ida and Maja, and I made our way down to the river with the guests. We made it down to the river. The water was crystal clear, but the water still was running a bit fast from the wet season that had just passed. I went down to the bank to check for any signs of a crocodile. I looked for tracks, but couldn't see any. I had an eerie feeling that I couldn't seem to shake, but, but there were no obvious signs of danger, so I called out for everyone to come down. Within 30 seconds of being down on the river, my little sister made a mudslide with the kids that came with the family. They looked like they were having lots of fun, so I decided to forget about the weird feeling I had and join in with them. After about 20 minutes of sliding down the bank, we were covered in mud from head to toe, so we hopped in the river to clean off. I swam to the middle of the river. It wasn't deep, but the current was strong, and I had to swim forward just to stay in the same spot. It was like a natural lap pool. When I got to the middle, I noticed a long figure floating down the river, like a torpedo heading through the water. After a couple of seconds, my brain rec recognised the familiar shape. It was a crocodile, a prehistoric beast with skin as tough as armour. It looked pretty big, big enough to be a salty. I shouted out and told everyone to get out of the water. The current was too strong for me to swim back across to the bank where I came from, so I swam to the other bank on the opposite side from home. I hopped out of the water onto the sand and looked around for the croc. In the corner of my eye, I saw the ripple of his head going under the water. I knew he noticed us, so I kept my distance. I called out asking for someone to go get help. The only one that left was my little sister. She ran all the way back to the house. It was about 1.2 kilometers. It might not seem that far, but for a seven year old running through the bush, that's a pretty long way. I had been on the other side for about 30 minutes. So I walked up the bank a little and sat in the shade and tried to keep calm and make sure everyone was okay. After checking up on everyone, I remembered that my Uncle Neil went fishing up river, so I told everyone to stay away from the water and made my way up the river. I climbed down the hill to the sand and walked towards the steep bank, but little did I know the croc was waiting for me. 
As I got closer, my dog started to bark. I took one more step and he jumped in the water and started swimming towards me. Before my eyes could adjust, I saw the shadow in the water and the wake from its long scaly tail. In that moment, time seemed to have stopped and I realized what was happening. My dog had saved my life, but at the cost of his own. Time went back to normal and all I could do was watch. Snap on his dinosaur-like jaws as he did his signature move, the death roll, leaving half of my dog in front of me. I was devastated. Now I knew the seriousness of the situation. If I wasn't smart, people could die. With tears pouring down my face, I walked up the bank and checked if everyone was okay. My voice was broken and the words were being interrupted by the sound of my panting. The killer hadn't left and half of my dog was still in the water. I think he was trying to get me to come closer. But after about 35 minutes, he came up and ate the rest of my dog and left without a trace of him ever being there. Finally, for what felt like forever, my dad, mum and sister came with the boat. The bank was too steep, so dad just walked across with a shotgun, but the crook was long gone. The memory of the water breaking as he took each step will never leave my memory. When he made it across, he grabbed me and said in a vengeful voice, we'll get that bastard, I promise, and we'll make a nice pair of boots out of it. Even today, I don't regret what happened, because the knowledge I gained from the experience will help keep me safe from accidents for years to come. The main lesson I learned was to always trust your Leon. Leon is a Nyingana and other Aboriginal people's term. It is your gut instinct, but even more than that, it is the way you feel about yourself and your connection to other people and the places surrounding you. Cigarettes and Gasoline by Zainab Safi. My grandfather was a wonderful man a doctor, a pharmacist, a published author, but most importantly, my greatest inspiration. Baba Khaled, I used to call him. He was always deep in concentration, his thick brows furrowed behind his glasses as he went over his next pharmaceutical book. He was never seen out of his crisp Italian crafted suits and smelled strongly of Old Spice aftershave and cigarettes. His thumbs were rough from breaking open blister packets to sort medication for his older patients. A cigarette always hung from his mouth and, when he was feeling fancy, a cigar. Sitting leg over leg, he recounted stories from his past as he burned through cigarette packets like there were sunflower seeds. We had a little routine, him and I. Every morning, just as the sun made his debut appearance and the birds sung their morning song, Father Khaled would walk me over to his greatest pride and joy. His sixth child, he called the Nardin's tree that sat at the corner of his garden, the backdrop of every family photo. He'd pick me up and let me pick out a Nardin's to split with him to have at breakfast. Between long jaws of his Marlboro cigarette, he spoke about his childhood, his days abroad, how he came to fall in love with my grandmother, and everything in between. He would always try to include a life lesson to take away from his stories. What did we learn today, Habibti? The story that sticks out the most isn't the heroic story of when he saved someone who had a gun against his head, or the time he was held for ransom by Al-Qaeda. It was the simplest of all, the story about the seven triangular UFOs he saw flash across the sky when he was a child. I used to be in the army, it was no plane. The realist in me had a hard time believing him, but the twinkle in his eyes and his small, reminiscent smile convinced me. I told him my own UFO story, going into an annoyingly excessive amount of detail, yet he still listened. I think that's why I so vividly remember that specific conversation. He listened to me. Adults don't do that to eight-year-olds, especially eight-year-olds with a tendency to ramble. He only ever broke his focus to move on to his next cigarette packet. We only went inside when the explosions got louder and the people who delivered gasoline came yelling down the street. I remember sitting with him on the old-fashioned metal-white seats that seemed to litter every garden in Baghdad. The confronting smell of gasoline, the whistle of wind passing through the date palm trees, and the roaring of distant explosions is still vivid in my mind. Baba Khaled confronted me by assuring that the explosions were just meteors hitting the earth. We spoke about the solar system for hours on end, him with his deep understanding and me with my third grade education. I still remember his faint smile as he told me how much he appreciated spending time with me. I'm boring you with my ramblings, but you'll miss me when I'm gone. He was right. I miss him more than I could have ever thought possible. The 28th of July, 2011 is a time that will forever be seared into my mind. It was the day I started to understand the complexities of human emotion. The phone rang from my parents' bedroom and my sleepy haze was ripped away by what I can only deem as hysteria. My mother on the floor, screaming. She cried and begged for one of us to deny the horrifying reality. My father kneeled beside her, comforting her and trying to garner any information. Baba Khaled was dead. I looked over at my extremely pregnant sister and saw panic pulsate through her eyes. 
She almost too calmly told us that her water broke and she needed to go to the hospital right now. My mother wiped away her tears and with a deep breath went with my sister to the hospital. I have yet to see someone go through the stages of grief so quickly. Standing from the sidelines, seeing my mother go through the extreme loss of her father and then moments later having to compose herself to accompany my sister in hospital was jarring. The explosion of human emotion scarred me. Coming to terms with having a person ripped away from my life forever was devastating and I refused to believe he was gone. I still have intrusive thoughts and lose myself in a world where everyone I love is taken away from me. The diagnosis? Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. He had quite literally died of heartbreak. After the death of my grandmother, he was a changed person. He stopped wearing his suits. He no longer smelled of Old Spice aftershave, only tobacco. He stopped going to work. He abandoned the book he was writing. Baba Khaled refused to go back to the home he had lived in with the love of his life for the past 50 years. For the first time in my mother's life, she saw her father's hard, determined exterior crumble. It was somewhat bittersweet, his death. He couldn't live without his second half and love eventually led to his demise. It wasn't until I looked through family photo albums years later that I finally processed his death. Memories flooded my mind of cold winter nights spent sitting by the fire with my grandfather and cousins of Narin's trees, Marlboro cigarettes, and the loud calls of men selling gasoline. Moments I had taken for granted. Looking back, I realized that it was easy for me to push his death to the darkest corners of my mind and pretend nothing had happened. I don't believe death itself is inherently evil. Death is the only guarantee in life, and I find comfort in that. Instead, I fear that I will never truly appreciate anyone in my life until they're taken away from me. I still harbor some regret. I guess that's just human nature, an inevitable part of life. I wish I had spent more time with him, woken up earlier, put my games down sooner, listened to just one more story, just one more shared nudge, just one more packet of cigarettes until the men selling gasoline came yelling down the street. But then I think about one of the lessons Baba Khaled taught me. Regret and guilt will get you nowhere. You can't change what you have done in the past, but the future is yours to bend to your will. All I can do now is love those in my life more fiercely every day. I find comfort in thinking that even after he's gone, my grandfather is still guiding me through life. I like to imagine that my nephew holds a little of my grandfather's soul. I like to imagine that I do, too.